economics is the study of how people cope with scarcity by making choices. Macroeconomics is the application of this uh, resource allocation, how we manage our scarce resources at a big scale, a country level scale usually, large economic phenomena. There may not be a bigger macroeconomic question than why are some countries richer than others? We're going to dive into that today. Hello, everybody, and welcome, welcome, welcome. Uh, we are going to be talking about productivity and uh, the income and wealth differences across countries today. Uh, so it should be a very interesting conversation if you're following along in ManQ. I believe it is chapter 25, at least of his Principles of Economics book. So let's go ahead and dive in. Mankiw starts the chapter by showing three pictures, three pictures, pictures of typical families in uh, very different countries. At the top left, we see a typical family in uh, the United Kingdom, right? Uh, we see all the things that they own lined up behind them. Let's see all the couches and the various appliances, things like this and a big nice house in the background, right? Looks like these folks also have uh, some kind of boat. How about that? We also see a typical family uh, in a country like uh, Mexico. And we see all the property that they own there in the back. And we see a typical family in a country like Mali with all the property that they own in their house here at the bottom. Clearly, uh, there is a difference in incomes and wealth across the world, very clearly. And uh, Mankiw takes this whole chapter to talk about why uh, do some countries economically grow and prosper and some don't. So let's take a look at this together. We can see different growth rates per year for different countries across roughly the same period, the late 1800s and early 1900s up to uh, the 20 teens, right? All of these countries grew at different rates over this time. Some of them grew an awful lot. We see Brazil grew 2.6% on average per year. Uh, this is the size of their real GDP, right? Uh, their quantities of production, recalling uh, our discussion a couple weeks ago on GDP. Some countries grew a little slower, like the UK growing at 1.4% across this period. But notice at all of these periods, GDP per person went up an awful lot. From hundreds or low thousands per person to tens of thousands or higher thousands per person, right? Our incomes uh, are going up over time. And this is something that we as a society should encourage. We want people to make more money, right? This is a good thing. We want uh, wealthy, healthy people. A higher GDP is generally correlated with such wonderful things as we talked about a couple chapters ago. Education, healthcare, things like this. So we want, we want uh, a high income uh, situation, high income. Uh, country. Mankey proposes that productivity is going to be perhaps our main explanation of these differences across countries. Um, referring to productivity as the quantity of goods and services produced from each unit of labor input. What does this mean? Well, what does an additional worker do to how much stuff you can make in these different countries? How effective are our workers. And there's a lot of different things that go into this, a lot of different reasons that our workers are going to have different levels of effectiveness, different abilities to produce, right? You know, remember, you know, GDP showed us uh, a country's income is essentially the same as output, right? Spending or incomes are, are, are uh, flip sides of the same thing. 
So really, it's a question of how much can your workers make in terms of both, you know, productive output and also in, you know, dollar figures. So what's going to lead to this? What determines our productivity? We've got four things. Main cue points to four big things. Physical capital per worker. This is a huge one. How much stuff do we have to allow our workers to produce? Uh, are there, is there lots of equipment and structures? We recall from the start of the class uh, that physical capital is uh, the tools and resources that we use in the production of goods, right? Factories, things like this. Some countries have an awful lot of physical capital that they've built up over hundreds of years, right? America has an awful lot of factories and grocery stores and all sorts of equipment, tools, and structures uh, to make workers more productive, right? Another question is human capital per worker. Uh, how educated and skillful are the workers in, in these countries? Uh, a you know, there, there may be a bit of a feedback loop here, you know, wealthier countries can uh, invest more in education and then uh, more educated individuals make wealthier countries, right? Uh, so this, this is a very important determinant as well. How, how can we uh, educate and ensure that our workers are highly skilled, highly effective workers, knowledgeable about the things that they are doing, right? And look at natural resources per worker. So what, uh, what's the makeup of our geography uh, across the world, right? So uh, what, what land, what bodies of water, what minerals do we have? Um, Productivity in some countries is very, very related to their natural resources. We can think of the Middle East, Venezuela, countries that are uh, very tied to their natural resources. In this case, oil. In the case of other countries, um, specifically several places in Africa, this may be minerals and diamonds and gems, things like this. Um, so our natural resources per worker will uh, play into our productivity, right? And it's also worth mentioning technical knowledge, you know, society's understanding of the best ways to produce goods and services. How good are your managers? How good are your leaders? Uh, these sorts of things. How, how effective uh, can we get our processes um, to minimize costs and maximize outputs? Something like that, right? Critical to understanding um, how some countries uh, grow faster than others is the ideas of diminishing returns and the catch-up effect. So diminishing returns is this idea that additional units of input, whether that's capital or labor or whatever, are less helpful than the inputs before. So you can picture something like this. All right, we got uh, three workers on our little job site and we're trying to hammer some nails to get this fence up, something like this, okay? Well, if we don't have any hammers, we got plenty of nails, plenty of workers, but we don't have any hammers. We're not going to be able to hammer nails very effectively. Well, then we buy one hammer and we get a, a huge, huge return from this first hammer, right? Adding a little bit more capital. That's what we got here on the x-axis is capital per worker. Adding a little bit more capital led to a huge increase in our output. And then we add a, a second hammer and, and we add a whole bunch more, right? But by the time we start adding third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh hammers, we have more hammers than we do workers. And eventually uh, our, our returns are not gonna be as strong as they were. Uh, that first guy having that first hammer is a lot more effective than you know having spare hammers laying around just in case somebody breaks or something, right? Um, so eventually uh, adding more inputs is less and less helpful. Well, the catch-up effect plays on this idea, and it's the idea that lower-income countries can grow faster than rich countries. Why is this? Well, because rich countries have already built up their uh, immense capital stock over hundreds of years, right? Um, there are some poor countries that don't have much of a capital stock at all. We said that physical capital per worker is one of the determinants of our productivity and our, our growth in GDP, right? So. It's very important to, to keep in mind physical capital stock as we try and figure out you know, uh, 
why a country is, is growing so fast. So there are a lot of great examples historically of lower income countries growing very quickly. Um, the most famous uh, are uh, five East Asian countries that have just absolutely taken off. Uh, economists refer to them as the Asian tigers, um, one of them being South Korea, Japan, Singapore, countries like this that very effectively since the 1940s or 50s or so have flown from being uh, third world countries uh, way, 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 way up to uh, catch up with uh, any other country. You know, Japan is now, I believe, the, the world's third largest economy or fourth. Very, very close up there, though. Um, so we can see how countries that were lagging behind have this ability to catch up pretty quickly by investing in that capital stock and uh, taking advantage of the fact that they haven't uh, seen this intense diminishing returns on their capital the way that rich countries have. So what can policymakers do to encourage growth, to encourage our country to uh, get richer, to raise our productivity? Well, first we can encourage saving. Um, in order for us to buy capital, to build factories, um, to buy expensive tools, somebody's got to save, somebody's got to invest in our industry. Um, so we, uh, we very important to build capital. So, you know, saving now uh, helps us grow faster and helps us enjoy uh, larger incomes in the future. There is a cost here, though. Uh, we have to cut consumption today, uh, just like it in your household. Uh, if you want to save money to buy something down the road, then you got to cut your consumption. You got to buy less stuff today. Well, our economy as a whole has to do the same thing. We want to encourage foreign investment, allowing capital to move across borders uh, and business techniques and strategies to move across border uh, is going to uh, encourage growth in companies here and abroad, right? Um, so very common for foreign companies to want to buy uh, U.S., really anything U.S., U.S. land, U.S. buildings, uh, U.S. stock, all these kinds of things, right? And we want to encourage that kind of behavior um, so that we have more uh, financial capital with which to purchase some uh, physical capital, right? Uh, we want to make sure we educate and nurture our young people, right? Um, healthier, educated people are more productive. It's, it's, it's an absolute fact. Um, so we want to focus on education. Um, we can engage in policies that are very common in the Western world, like uh, universal education, um, public schools, we might call them, you know, free public schooling, very common in the Western world. Um, and we want to encourage that for everybody. This is not the case in many countries. Many countries don't have an, the financial resources necessary to provide public schooling to all of their uh, young people. But on top of that, there are many countries that uh, say you can go to school and you can't go to school uh, based on all sorts of characteristics. Sometimes it's how much money you have. Sometimes it's um, more distressing things, you know, uh, very common in certain parts of the world to not allow uh, young ladies to go to school, you know, girls being banned from school on the basis of sex. This kind of thing is uh, going to hinder your ability to be productive, right? You want educated, productive individuals in your society. So we got to make sure we're healthy and educated. We have to ensure stable property rights and a legal system. So the property rights, you want to know uh, if you work hard to get things that they can't be stolen and that the government isn't going to rip you off and businesses aren't going to rip you off. Now, obviously, there's some amount of this that goes on in every society, but you do notice in uh, societies that have extremely high levels of uh, corruption and uh, government weight uh, where everybody expects a a little cut, a little bribe here and there. This is very common in some parts of the world. Uh, you know, this is going to erode your trust in one another and your trust in the government. And you're not going to have this in same incentive to work hard, right? And the legal system is very important uh, too. We, we have to have recourse uh, to enforce our contracts. So uh, if I work for you and you do me wrong, I have to have a, a way to, to make it right, uh, and our, uh, a fair legal system does this to some extent. 
So it's important to have uh, property rights and a legal system to encourage uh, our growth. As we said, I think in week three, we do want to encourage free trade, right? Uh, potentially, this can increase our wealth, right? Uh, obviously, we've seen over and over that uh, some small parts of the population may lose jobs because of policies like freeing up trade. But as a general rule, uh, we are able to buy more stuff at lower prices. And that's a fantastic thing. One last thing, we can encourage research and development. We can invest in things like NASA and the National Science Foundation and encourage our, uh, you know, people like university professors and other researchers uh, to learn more, especially in sciences and engineering, right? Very critical to advance all these technologies, all these processes. So all of these would be different steps policymakers uh, might take to uh, encourage our future growth. How does population and population growth affect our economic growth? Well, I have the perspective of two uh, very differing uh, points of view on this. Uh, two economists. One is Thomas Malthus over here on the left. Uh, he lived during the Industrial Revolution, uh, the 1800s. He predicted that you know, pop populations would grow so quickly that uh, people would starve. Essentially, humanity had reached its carrying capacities. And uh, if you grew up in the Industrial Revolution and saw a mostly agrarian farm-based society like the United Kingdom turn into a very city-oriented, uh, mechanized society very quick, you may have uh, led, been led to the same conclusion. Uh, Malthus saw a lack of natural resources that we wouldn't be able to feed everybody. Uh, in addition to this, um, modern economists add we may dilute our capital stock. So capital per worker matters, right? So if we increase our population too quickly and our capital, per, uh, capital stock doesn't grow with it, our physical tools that we need don't grow with our population, uh, we may run into problems of uh, not have enough hammers for the work team, right? Not having enough physical capital to be that same level of productivity. So these are some points against population and population density, um, potential problems that we may run into. Um, a more recent economist, Michael Kramer, argued that uh, throughout human history, the more people live in a place, the faster economies and technologies develop. Um, he wrote a seminal paper, a very famous paper, um, detailing why even since the dawn of man thousands of years ago, having more people all together uh, allows us to grow economically and technologically more quickly. Why is this? Well, we get to enjoy those benefits from specialization. Um, you know, eventually you get a big enough city, a big enough congregation of people that everybody has very specific niche roles and we all get very good at those specific niche roles. And this is a big reason that we see this. Uh, you know, and in response to Thomas Malthus, we can now see that, you know, food production is on unimaginable scales compared to uh, the time of Malthus, right? And it's because in a lot of ways, Kramer was right. Once we all crowded together in cities, something Malthus was very against, right? Very afraid of. Uh, we were able to specialize and grow our technology. Then we took this technology, brought it back to the fields, and we were far more productive. I want to say at the start of the uh, American nation, like in the late 1700s, uh, like roughly half the people worked in farming, and now roughly two to three percent work in farming. Um, so we don't we don't need as many workers or resources to produce way more food now, thanks to all the technological growth that has happened since the time of Malthus. Well, there you have it, guys. Um, here's some different arguments on population. We've looked at the causes and uh, potential things we can do to encourage growth. So thank you guys very much. I'll catch you next time.